I'm Dr. Marce Wilder. I am delighted to be moderating this session on mentorship, sponsorship, and coaching. As we all know, mentorship is critical to any successful career, but what we may not feel comfortable with is how to obtain it, how to be effective in that role, and where sponsorship and coaching may assist us with our academic success. Today, we are delighted and honored to have two successful academic emergency physicians who've been very productive in research and are helping to groom our next generation of researchers through mentorship, sponsorship, and coaching. Dr. Deborah Dirks is a professor and chair of, emerg of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center. She holds the Odd and Bernard Rappaport Distinguished Chair in Clinical Care and Research. She's a nationally recognized leader in the specialty. She oversees the emergency medicine program at Parkland Memorial Hospital at UT Southwestern University Hospital, uh, which together constitutes one of the largest emergency medicine programs in the nation. After receiving her undergraduate degree in microbiology and immunology from the University of California, Berkeley, she attended Tufts School of Medicine. She completed her residency in emergency medicine at the University of Cincinnati and joined the faculty of the University of California, Davis, and later obtained her master's degree from Harvard University School of Public Health. Dr. Dierks has received NIH funding for research on early management of acute coronary syndromes, the influence of gender on symptom characteristics, and utilization of cardiac biomarkers. She has held numerous leadership positions within SAM and was presented the Society's 2014 Advancement of Women in Academic Emergency Medicine Award. Additionally, Dr. Dirks is an Associate Editor of Circulation and Academy and Academic Emergency Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Dirks. Dr. Willard Sharp is an Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine, Section of Emergency Medicine at the University of Chicago. Dr. Sharp runs an NIH-funded basic science lab investigating the role of mitochondrial injury and metabolism in cellular injury following cardiac arrest. Recent work has focused on the role of mitocardial fission and fusion in mediating injury and outcomes in murine models of cardiac arrest. Dr. Sharp received his undergraduate degree in biology and history at Wolford College in South Carolina before pursuing his PhD at the University of South Carolina in biomedical science. He completed NIH-funded postdoctoral work at the University of Illinois at Chicago, followed by his MD degree at the University of South Carolina. During his medical training, he received a Rotary International Fellowship to spend a year at the John Radcliffe Hospital and Oxford University studying gene therapy. He then completed residency training in emergency medicine at the University of Michigan before obtaining a faculty appointment at the University of Chicago. Dr. Sharp has experience in mentoring pre-doctoral, post-doctoral, residents, and junior faculty, and is interested in encouraging young EM trainees to pursue research in basic science. He's co-founder of an unofficial SIA in basic science and translational science interest group for EM trainees and physicians, and is a member of SAM and ASEP research committees. Welcome to our panelists. This is a live recorded webinar. We're going to ask some rapid fire questions to our panelists, giving them just a few minutes to answer each question. And then we're going to leave some time at the end for questions that are in the chat. Um, this discussion can probably be applied to other aspects of your academic career, but the focus here will mainly be research. So our first question, uh, I thought Mar we'd- Marcy, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Dr. Paxton has joined us. Oh, wonderful, Dr. Paxton. Um, I'm going to quickly read Dr. Paxton's bio. Thank you for alerting me. Um, hello, Dr. Hi. Paxton received his MD and MBA degree from the University of Cincinnati before completing his emergency medicine residency at Henry Ford Hospital. He is currently an associate professor of emergency medicine at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Paxton works clinically in the emergency departments at Detroit Receiving Hospital and Sinai Grace Hospital. He's mentored hundreds of medical students and residents on various research projects. And Dr. Paxton recently served as chairman of the Wayne State University MP2 Institutional Review Board. He is currently the DRH Director of Clinical Research. He's an active clinical researcher and has had and has served as principal investigator for numerous industry and publicly funded trials. He's edited several books on emergency medicine topics, including a recent primer focused on resident research and scholarly projects in emergency medicine. Welcome, Dr. Paxson. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to do our rapid fire questions. We're gonna start with medical student research mentorship. Uh, many of us has probably noticed in reviewing medical student applications for EM residencies that students list several research experiences, but often don't have any abstracts or publications listed. 
What are your thoughts on this? And what is your approach to mentoring students in research? I'm gonna start with Dr. Dukes. Yeah, so I think this has become even more interesting since a lot of medical schools have now put in a block for scholarship. So there's a lot more opportunity for the medical students to participate in research. Um, getting it to a publication though, we all know it takes much more than three months that they're given. And so really when you engage a student in a research endeavor, it's really trying to understand what they want from it. Um, I think my goal is to always get them to an abstract at least because I think that's really important. And if we're gonna put the time in, we might as well get something for it. If I compare them with a the junior faculty, it's even better because that helps the junior faculty. I do think though, the most important thing is making sure the student can explain the project. You know, I think that's, uh, we've all interviewed med school students who have said, oh, I did research and they can't tell you anything about it. They can't tell you really what the pro what the hypothesis was, what were they trying to show, what the problem they're trying. They can tell you what they did, but not why they did it. And so I think one of the essential components, if you're gonna put research on your CV, be a, own it, own all of it, understand it, and be able to articulate why and what you did. Uh, Dr. Paxson? Yeah, that's great. I mean, absolutely. I think um, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of different students and I've seen a lot of variety there. There are some students that come in uh, with a clear vision of what they want to achieve. They have objectives. Maybe they even have an area of interest and those students are going to do great. Uh, they're going to publish, I think, at some point and they're going to have a lot to talk about. They're going to understand the topic. But I think one of the dilemmas you have when you first meet a student is understanding what their motivations are because uh, you know, students are told that they needed to, quote, do research, end quote, uh, to build their resume. And they feel that so many students are doing this to try to build a resume and may not have an intrinsic interest in research itself. So I think you have to identify that early so that you can help them to meet their needs. Um, I think it's, that is a challenge. And I think if you miss that step, then you can misunderstand what they're doing and what they're there for. So I think identifying their, their objectives, their goals for the project, for any, any project, and then how much time they have to commit, absolutely. So uh, once you've gone through that phase, I think you can match people up with a project that will be productive, um, but it's difficult. Um, and you know, some students have more time than others, more interest than others. You just have to gauge that individually. Dr. Sharp? Um, I completely concur with Dr. Dirks and Dr. Paxton. Um, again, it's trying to establish early on what the student's goals are. Um, so if it's a three month uh, rotation through the lab for the summer, you know, what are they intending to get out of it? What's their long term career goals? Again, if it's like a checkbox, um, I tend to steer those students away because I'm like, you know, if it's one thing you just want to get your hands wet at the lab and you want to kind of understand, kind of experience it. And then, you know, you may not have any interest in it going forward. That's OK. That's that's fine. But um, just trying to get a big picture of what their goals are. And then I think also just giving them a an achievable project with the time frame that you have. So obviously they're not going to be able to do a big paper. They may not even be able to have enough for an abstract. But at least if they could get one figure or co contribute to the data that goes into one figure, then they're an author on the paper. So I, I if they've got data in the abstract or in the paper, then they're an author. So then they come away with something. So very important. Well, let's transition to talk about residency. Uh, many programs struggle with a mentorship program and scholarly activity, especially research. How does your department get faculty to mentor residents in research and what kind of projects, what's their role, the faculty members, and how are you ensuring that they complete them and that the residents actually produce scholarly work? And then how do you determine if they get authorship? I'm going to start with Dr. Paxton. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I uh, have served as director of resident research at my institution, and I think that is an essential role when working with residents. I, I, it's very challenging to match a resident, especially with a mentor, with a faculty member. Um, it take, I, I think it's harder than a medical student because I think that you know residents have different needs than, than medical students. Uh, there is a scholarly activity requirement for residents in most, well, all programs, and some programs are more research heavy than others. So maybe the resident is at a program where they're required to do research or expected to do research, and maybe they're not. At my program, uh, they're not required to do research. So if a resident comes to me and says, I want to do research, that person's kind of the rare gem. And that person, I'm going to spend a lot more time, and I can spend a lot more time on that individual because there aren't as many of them. Uh, if I were at a, at a program that required research as part of the residency experience, then 
uh, that would be a lot harder. And I think having a person in your department that's designated to be the resident research coordinator, if you will, is very helpful uh, to really get to know the residents and what they're expecting from the, the um, experience, and then trying to find that perfect mentor if there is one. Uh, in terms of productivity, it's I think it's the same as with students. It has to be uh, internally motivated. The residents um, can certainly jump into a project that's already uh, in progress, but I think when residents are excited about the project, and or maybe they came up with a project idea uh, in rare cases, I think that's when you're expecting them to be more productive and, and to really motivate themselves. Uh, as a mentor, I think you have to kind of set firm timelines for the resident and make them stick to the timelines that are needed in order to produce whatever you're going to do, whether it be a poster or, or, a, or a paper. So I think that's a big role for the mentor is, is um, setting a timeline and then enforcing it, or at least reminding the resident that they have one. Dr. Sharp? Um, yeah, just following up on James's uh, comments, I think, you know, motivation by the residents uh, and trying to inspire the residents to be motivated. So even when I'm on a shift, I'm always, you know, they'll, you know, is there a sort of a research question that is built into the clinical problem that we're seeing and just get them thinking about it. But um, at the end of the day, um, a lot of times they'll, they assign faculty to certain residents and, you know, they may not be interested at all what I have in my, my research area, but what I'll do is I'll point them to, in our discussions, I'll point them to other faculty that probably might align more closely. So I think it's important establishing faculty mentorship early on in the residency, but then having those faculty then direct the residents to other faculty who might have a deeper dive into the area of research that they're interested in. Um, so again, it really points out to, to motivation, the residents who've been able to do I feel like well research wise in our program are the ones also that are pretty solid clinically they feel like they've got their feet on the ground and they're kind of progressing and then um, um and then they're able to hook in with a faculty member that really has an active program you know they're not having to start it's really tough i think sometimes when you're trying to start a program from scratch with the limited amount of time in residency so it does work well when you have a faculty member that's already got a project and and going and then they're able to kind of plug into that but uh, that's my experience uh, yeah, I agree with you. That faculty resident matchup is so crucial for them being successful. Dr. Dukes? Yeah, so, you know, I think there's really two ways that we see residents, you know, get engaged in research. And like you said, like already mentioned, one is when they jump onto a project that's already ongoing so they can participate. And the other one is when they come up with their own idea. And kind of like most researchers, I love it when they come up with their own idea because they are bought in, right? They know that they are excited to finish it and really get it done. And so I think that's personally, what makes me more, you know, more excited to mentor a resident is when they come up with their own idea. I think, though, you mentioned here, what about authorship? And I think that's something that really needs to be defined at the beginning. So if a resident is going to jump into a project, I think we need to be clear with them what it takes to become an author on that project. And yes, there are guidelines out there to do it, but the practical matter of it's what we expect to them to enroll, what we expect them to accomplish, along with reviewing and editing manuscripts. And I really do think that needs to be transparent at the beginning. Um, I also believe that it takes years to get things done and that uh, having a faculty member invested in the research project to take it to completion is best use of everyone else, everyone involves time. You know, majority of the pro our projects in a three-year program, they get published after the resident leaves, right? So they've moved on either to an academic career or to the community or whatever. But um, it takes investment in the faculty because once they're gone, it's going to be the faculty who is actually going to be submitted the paper. And so having that discussion, understanding that process and understanding what it's going to take to be an author when you're no longer at the institution is really important. Well, moving up the chain, we've talked about mm -hmm. medical students and, research, uh, and residents. Let's talk about faculty members. How does a new faculty member who wants to engage in research hit the ground running and maximize opportunities for research success? as opposed to saying either yes to too many things and getting overwhelmed or not engaging at all and not advancing their career. So basically balancing research as being part of an academic faculty member. I will start with Dr. Sharp. Come back to you. Um, that's, yeah, it's a difficult question. Um, I think it's always trying to find that right balance and I'm not sure I've found that balance even. Um, I think it is it's really trying to be focused and trying to be synergistic. So finding projects that align with your area of academic interest. So, you know, maybe you're interested in healthcare disparities, but then 
getting involved in an administrative project on how to like enhance triage methods or something either that might be a discrepancy so you might want to there may be other projects that you're interested in that like you can focus your your interest um rather than trying to be try to be so broad and do everything um although that being said you can certainly do projects that i think build your methodology so if there's re you know research projects that may not necessarily be closely aligned with what you're doing but they build out your 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 methodologies, I think that that's in line. So it's always a tightrope of trying to, you know, maybe be a little overcommitted, but at the same time, not promising that you're going to get things done and then and then dropping the ball and then and people losing their, um, you know, they're just stop expecting you to complete projects. So tough, tough, tough job to handle. Uh, Dr. Paxton. Well, I, my my opinion, I think about emergency medicine is that we tend to be distractible um, and tend to be <laughs> interested in a lot of things, you know. And uh, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for myself, and that I I have a hard time saying no. I always have, and I think that's a can be a disadvantage at times. I think what's important for a new faculty member to remember is that there are resources that exist in your environment, and you need to identify those early. Um, that might be individuals who are already rock stars at doing what you want to be doing. That might be uh, resources at, on the departmental or institutional level that you can tap into. I think if you don't spend time in the beginning learning what your resources are that are available to you, then you're suffering a disadvantage for no reason. So I would suggest that early you know, junior faculty um, would look for what are the resources available to me already, and that will help them identify the things that they still need to find. Uh, I think being perceptive, engaged, and inquisitive, these are important things for a new faculty member to do. And because of that, I think it's okay in my mind to say yes a lot in the beginning because you may not know what you wanna do. Uh, you may have a lot of interests. And, and I think it's unfortunate to get too many things on your plate, but I think it's also unfortunate to anchor too quickly and to not explore ideas or, or studies or concepts that might be more appealing and, and offer more experiences. So. I think it's good to say yes early, but I think at some point in the career, you need to sit back and say, okay, I've tried a lot of stuff. What speaks to me on, an, on a personal level? What am I most interested in? And then start maybe to start to say no a little more. And I think by the time you reach a mid-level or a senior uh, research position, you probably are saying no more than part of the time. And that's probably like expected and normal. But I think in the beginning, uh, it's good to be open to new ideas and to just kind of keep your eyes open and see what's going on around you so you can learn more about what you personally are going to want to be doing during your career. I, I just want to interject and say that was exactly kind of my situation. I'm very junior faculty. I'm, this is my uh, third year as faculty after a two-year research fellowship. And I said yes to everything, really. Um, and my mentor said, okay, you got to start saying a little bit of no, but I've garnered some opportunities that I will not let go of. I've started teaching undergraduate research courses, and I love it. They're so excited. And even if I start to say no to other things, I've opened myself to opportunities that I probably would not have um, had I been like mid-career and, you know, people come to me and saying, you know, try this opportunity. Um, so I, that, I think that's great advice. I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Dirk. Yeah, you know, I think I still say yes to almost everything. I mean, maybe that's my weakness and stuff, but I really have not ever learned the, how to say the word no um, well at all. But I think as a junior faculty, I think for me, it was, it has been and will always be about finding your people, right? Finding people that you enjoy working with, that you're willing to stay and crunch numbers with for hours. And yes, usually they're in the topic area you're interested in because that's what gives you excited. But once you have that collaborative network, you know, in your institution or out, they really are going to help you build your career. I also think that we need to do a better job defining what research is to our trainees and our junior faculty. You're, whenever you are tempted to solve a problem and they're measuring something, uh, you know, measuring the solution or measuring an outcome member, that can be turned into research, right? You have a hypothesis, you did an intervention, and you're measuring a change. That's research. And so we continue to kind of separate our clinical operations you know strategies and improvements from that idea that it's research and i think that we would do much better about getting junior faculty engaged if they recognize what they're doing is actually research as long as they measure something you know and that's anything from education to clin ops to pure basic science research right and so um i think as a junior faculty i think the keys are say yes because you never know what the opportunities are out there 
and you never know how that's going to impact your career later on. Find your people, find people that you enjoy bouncing ideas with, that you feel comfortable being vulnerable, being told you're stupid or that's a night stupid, you know, like people that can rip you and you're like good with it, right? I mean, I have friends that continue to tell me I'm stupid all the time, but it's fun because we, you know, I know they're not serious, um, but it makes me better. And then also be a lifelong learner. You know, I think that research is all about honing your skills and understanding that methodology changes and differs in different areas and there are different techniques to use and continue to grow. That's from junior faculty to more senior faculty because things have evolved during my career. And so really learn from everyone around you. Like, you know, like Dr. Passion said, you know, talk to somebody who does some methodology that you don't do if it's going to help you. And I think that really is what makes research a career that you continue to grow in. And that is what makes it fun. All right. Moving on. Um, what about that faculty member who needs to engage in research, but maybe not want to engage in research and you, you know, sign them up to work with you on a project? How do you handle that faculty member who doesn't really appear to be interested or engaged? doesn't do what you ask of them for the project and isn't really responding to emails. Uh, what do we do with that faculty member? I'll start with you, Dr. Sharp. Um, yeah, I was, you know, again, there, a lot of times there may be something that's going on with that faculty member, right? There may be something going on in their life, personally, professionally. Um, and I think it's just important to very like reach out and try to figure out why, you know, because a lot of times I find that people aren't reaching out because there's some issue. It's not because they're just ignoring you or they've missed the timeline. There's there's some other issue or they're afraid to reach out. You know, they, they didn't complete the objective. And so then they're hesitant to talk to you because they don't haven't made progress. But then it's important to keep those lines of communication so that even if, you know, maybe you didn't meet the deadline or meet the goal, you keep reaching out and interacting and making progress. So, and then in the end, maybe there's another, you know, maybe there is a professional reason, you know, there's another, um, something they're just not interested in the project, then that can also be addressed and trying to find out what they are interested in or what motivates them. Because I think everyone in emergency medicine is motivated by something or has an interest in, that would be probably applicable to some area. Like Dr. Dirks was saying, any, anything that you do, if you're measuring an outcome, that's probably research. So finding that faculty member's interest and, and finding out what's motivating them is important. Uh, Dr. Dirks, I'll go back to you. Yeah, no, I really like that concept of first checking with them to make sure there's not a reason why they haven't responded. I think the next step after that is making sure they understood your, your expectations. Right. Have we been clear enough about what we need from them and when we need it by, you know, no one likes to let people down. Exactly. You know, we're all that kind of type A personality wouldn't have gotten to where we are without it. And so um, I think as a mentor and as somebody who's leading a project, it's our job to set clear expectations and clear deadlines. Um, so people aren't surprised when we go back to them and say, what do you mean you haven't gotten it done? Or I haven't heard from you and I've been waiting for this. Um, and that's really what good teamwork is. Everyone understands the role and understands when they have to complete the role with. And finally, Dr. Paxson. Yeah, I think the hardest part of this is really trying to understand if, if this is really a problem with the, the other person or a problem with you. Um, you know, I, I can say from personal experience that I've had several occasions where I was working with a colleague on a project and they were not being responsive. And I, my assumption, because I, th I think we all view each other through our own experiences, through the lens of our own experience, my, my belief was that this person was blowing me off because they weren't responding, but in reality, as has been stated by the other panelists, they had other things going on, you know, and, and this was not a priority for them at that moment. And I think if I understood that from the beginning, I would have probably reacted uh, the right way. Um, but when you make assumptions about a person's motivation, whether it be their action or lack of action, I think that's when you get into problems. So the simple solution is to find out what is the explanation for the behavior and then, you know, if it is, if it is what you think it is, then you know how to behave. But if it's not, then you can choose to behave differently. And I think um, that is a challenge, I think, for all of us to, to view each other through each other's, through the other person's experience and understand the motivations that people have. And I don't think, I'm not a person who believes that, uh, that leaders can directly motivate people. I think leaders' job is to help people motivate themselves. And if you are trying to motivate people uh, using external uh, means, I think you are going to have a hard time. And the better way, in my opinion, is to find out what makes an individual work. What is it that they enjoy? What is it that they're doing? Uh, why are they doing what they're doing? 
so that you can help to provide the things they need to motivate themselves in the way that you want them to be motivated. Absolutely. All right, so let's switch gears here uh, and talk about sponsorship. What is sponsorship to you and how does it differ from mentorship? And have you had anyone fulfill this role for you or others in your department and briefly discuss how it made a difference in your academic and research career? Were you ever a sponsor for everyone, anyone else? And give an example or some tips about what was most effective and helpful for the individuals that you sponsored. Let's start with Dr. Deer. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think just to kind of differentiate a mentor and a sponsor, and, and I do think of it as a cookbook, right? A mentor is going to give you a recipe to make a, you know, a recipe to make a meal. They're going to tell you exactly how to do it. The, st the key steps are needed. And they're going to say, here it is. I'm going to, uh, together, we're going to decide this is what it is. You're going to make the best meal ever. A sponsor is going to say, hey, what meal are you going to make? Right? I'll provide the ingredients to you, but you got to make it yourself. You got to come up with a direction and everything. But I'm going to help you. Know, I'm going to open that door. And I think sponsors are extremely important in a career. Um, I think they open doors that you that let you in. And I've had great sponsors throughout my career who probably when they sponsored me had no idea how it was going to impact me, you know, later on. You know, I, I honestly, I, I always tell the story that I would not have this job had my chair when I was a resident not sponsored me into a national cardiac registry. And on that group happens to be the search committee, two people on the search committee of where I have my job now. And so they called me from that experience. So completely years apart, but it was that initial sponsorship that really helped me later on. Now, sponsorship is a risk, right? The sponsor's taking a risk and saying, I believe in this person so much, I'm going to, I'm going to give my name and say, this is somebody worth a shot. And, and then you have to walk away. You know, that's your job. You, you can't go from a sponsor back to a mentor to make right. them succeed. Are you, you really negated the value that you've given that person? You kind of have to let them fly. And yeah, you're there to help them if things go the wrong way, because you're going to hear about it. But your job as a sponsor is to let someone soar. And that is really the, the kind of the role of it. And it is, again, so important in academic emergency medicine um, in many different aspects of your career. Uh, yes, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Sharp. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question. Um, you know, you didn't really hear, at least in my perception, um, I, I didn't really hear about sponsorship until really the last several years. And um, as I understand it, that, um, you know, traditionally a mentor would um, help you, you know, they would help, you know, give you advice and help um, give you the resources to succeed. But also, if they're if they were tied into an organization that needed, you know, maybe they need a, a leader for a certain conference, they would sponsor you. They would say, "Hey, this is my junior mentee. I would like them to, you know, maybe share this session." Um, so they're kind of sponsoring them in leadership roles. And so um, my understanding is that that also happens in the business world. And so what you find is, is a lot of times, you know, uh, people get to where they're going based on their mentor. If you look at Nobel Prize winners, people who win Nobel Prize winners had Nobel Prize winners as their mentors. OK, so there's like a chain. There's a, a, a continuity. And so in the business world, they were recognizing that, you know, maybe that minorities or um, underrepresented um, populations are not getting into positions of leadership. And one way that you might be able to do that is, is that maybe someone's kind of outside the traditional mentor mentee circles, but they are sort of they have great promise. And as a men, as a as a person in position or power, you recognize that potential and you sponsor that person to um, give a talk or you you invite them to chair a session at a national meeting. You give them an opportunity to shine and show what they've got. So. Um, I think that this concept, really academically, at least from my perception, has really come from the business world and it's moving into academia um, because um, for me, like traditionally, the mentor was the sponsor, was the coach, was the, the mentor, sort of all these things wrapped up. And now we're kind of realizing there really are different elements and, and maybe the mentor is not the sole person for all of those things. And like so Dr. Dirk said, you know, key parts of your career can really move ahead if you had a sponsor to help you move forward. So I think this separation of these concepts has actually been a very good thing. So. Absolutely agree. Dr. Paxton. Yeah, I, I, I think 
I agree with those comments. I think it's it's a it's kind of playing a word game. Uh, not you guys, but I mean, it, it, when we talk about mentorship and sponsorship, I think it's it means different things to different people. And I, I think traditionally, perhaps in the past, mentorship incorporated sponsorship, and that was anticipated to be part of it. But I I think the more we learn, the more we know, we understand that mentorship and sponsorship are different things. And some people have had lots of mentors and no sponsors. Others have had lots of sponsors and no mentors. And I think it's a, an important distinction to make, if only to identify where an individual needs to seek out additional assistance. Um, the way I view it is a mentor, mentorship is a form of relationship in which someone is sharing their knowledge and experience with another person. And generally speaking, the mentor in that relationship is someone who has more, uh, maybe more of an advanced um, title or rank in the organization, whether it be the medical field or other. And oftentimes the mentee is a more junior individual, though I don't think that has to be the case. I think you can mentor someone who's more senior to you. It just depends on what is the content that you're trying to share. But I think the key distinction is that the um, mentor is someone who's sharing knowledge and experience, but not necessarily someone, as Dr. Dirk said, who is actually putting themselves at risk to advocate for the, the other person. And so once you've progressed, I think, as a mentor beyond um, simply offering advice, uh, then perhaps you become a sponsor and that person becomes a protege or someone that you're investing your, um, your perhaps, perhaps you're getting emotionally attached to that person. You're, you're excited about their successes. You're um, looking for ways to um, help them succeed uh, well and above giving them advice on things that they, they should do. Um, I think that requires trust and confidence uh, on both sides. I think you have to trust your mentor uh, and then your sponsor. Uh, in order to have that that strong of a relationship, and it isn't going to happen in all cases. I don't think everyone who has a mentor or a mentee is going to be able to develop a sponsorship relationship, and and I don't think that you should expect it to happen um, uh, by default. I think it has to be an effort on both sides to develop that maybe more personal relationship or more personal investment in the individual and show mutual respect and genuine interest. Um, and I, I've been lucky to have many sponsors, um, certainly many mentors, but many sponsors as well. And um, you know, my chair, for example, was uh, very uh, influential in getting me to join certain like national groups. And um, that was um, those were things that I might not have been able to do at that stage in my career, much as Dr. Dirk said. And I think that is some it is a form of sponsorship, uh, getting someone into a situation or an experience that they wouldn't have otherwise had access to. Um, you can't, but you can't. Um, control how successful that person is in that in that capacity. That's up to them. So I think you're you're putting your foot in the door. You're opening the door, but they have to walk through it. They have to actually do the work. And so it's a uh, it's you know both people are involved and both are necessary uh, to have a successful sponsorship. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to my chair, who I believe is like a sponsor for me. And when we discussed it, uh, he had a perfect quote. He said, "I believe that I should be sponsoring all of my faculty." And for me, sponsorship means putting your name in rooms of opportunity. And I liked how he framed that. Um, so now we're going to move on to something else that's kind of, um, you know, moving in the wordplay. We're going to talk about coaching. What is a professional coach? And what are your thoughts about coaching in the research and academic world? Do you have a coaching system at your respective institutions? And have you heard of some best practices or how a coach can improve academic success, especially as a researcher? I will open it up to Dr. Sharp first. Okay. It's, so, like, Russian, it's like Russian roulette. I just keep coming back. <laughs> well, I know Dr. Dirks has a lot of uh, expertise in this. So mm -hmm. I, I could tell you that our, our section and department does not have a formal sponsorship, but the residents do. The residents do have a formal sponsorship program. Um, so, or not sponsorship, but coaching. And so I think, I think you know, just like anyone who wants to improve, if you're a, a pro top professional tennis players have coaches, right? So um, it's not like they can't learn from someone who's observing them and giving them feedback. So I think uh, feedback professionally and personally is important. And I think coaching is a wonderful idea. Um, I understand that it can be pretty expensive if you get a, a professional um, coach. And so hopefully departments are trying to, to navigate that. I think a lot of places will provide coaching opportunities that are not necessarily personalized, but maybe for the general faculty in terms of um, educational platforms. But um, I think coaching is a great idea um, and it's a great thing. I think a lot of us have to try to rely more on self-coaching 
Um, I'm going to throw that in there. I don't know if that's really a concept, but, you know, trying to self-improve is always important. And so, I mean, if you look at, um, I've been reading, you know, going back and reading, you know, some of the works of Benjamin Franklin. And if you look at his things, he had daily exercises in which he was always assessing what he got done during the day and whether he was improving. And so, you know, he had a list of, you know, of, uh, a list of virtues and am I improving like which virtues am I failing at which virtues am I trying to improve at so I think um sort of just having a personalized um coaching plan for yourself is important so reading outside of medicine and reading um, things that um, help motivate you to self-improve but I'll leave it to the other two panelists to talk more about professional coaching opportunities all right I'll bring it over to Dr. Dukes yeah, so uh, when I took a chair job, I was given a professional coach um, and that kind of is, you know, I served a good three, four years. I think it's really important to understand what coaching tries to derive and the kind of the principle behind coaching is that it's an iterative discussion and where the person being coached gets to their solution. If they're not told it, you know, they're not, they're actually, they get to it through this discussion. And so coaching is not for everyone. If I need to quickly figure out how to get to point A and point B, going to a coach would probably frustrate the death out of me because I'd be like, just give me the answer. I just want to understand. Um, and so it really is a process that you have to be willing to self-invest and to work through some issues. Um, that being said, it is very rewarding to have a coach to talk through tough discussions and tough issues with. Um, in research, maybe how do you manage a team? And talking through a coach on how you can best you know, take the skills and, and be a sounding board to develop better team management. I think that's where coaching could come into a lot of value. It is expensive, although I wasn't charged for what my institution charged, I am sure it is, um, but I've used it. I've used it for faculty. Um, what, I, what I don't like about it is when you use it for faculty and you use this kind of, as Dr. Paskins could talk, talk about more performance driven, it has a negative connotation associated with it. Like, oh, I have to go to a coach because I suck at blank, um, right? But, but on the flip side, it's been really helpful on the people who are really receptive to it to kind of address some of the performance issues that they're having. We've also used it in our department as group coaching. And that was really a lot more successful than I thought it would be. And it was able just to get a, a coach came in during uh, early on in the pandemic and was able to hold kind of virtual coaching sessions for about 10 faculty members to get through and just discuss kind of issues that they were having and kind of what was going on in their life. And that was something that um, I've actually asked our, uh, our dean to continue. Um, the institution itself has started to, to, to invest in coaches. And so every department was given the opportunity to have someone trained as a coach. Uh, Mark Court is currently being trained in our department to kind of facilitate more, not necessarily coaching for our group, but for others so we can have some more free interchange of the use of coaching. So I think it's really valuable. I would hate for people to think it's only for bad things. I think it can help you really on making good things better and elevating things also. All right, uh, Dr. Paxton. Well, thanks for that amazing segue, Dr. Dirks. I, I, I think it's um, it's absolutely right. Yeah, so so coaching obviously doesn't have to just be for deficits or for problems. It can be to make something good better. Um, I think we can probably agree that Ben Franklin was a pretty productive guy. And obviously, you know, self-coaching worked for him. But I think, you know, the, the, the way I think about coaching as opposed to mentorship and sponsorship is that coaching, I think, is, is performance driven. Um, rather than maybe developmentally driven or, or driven to develop the individual, you're looking to achieve specific tasks, specific metrics, specific goals. Um, and I think from my perspective that you need to identify what those goals are in advance so that you know uh, what kind of coaching you need and the coach can be effective in getting you there. Um, so I think that it's, it's kind of preliminary to having a, an effective coaching relationship that you need to have some mentorship and sponsorship so you know uh, which direction you're trying to go and what your goals are going to be. Um, I think often if you don't have a concrete test that coaching would probably be more challenging because well, where are we going with this. Uh, and I think that's why maybe it does tend to be viewed as a punitive or, or for, for people with deficits because uh, there are metrics that they're failing to meet and you want them to meet the metrics, but uh, it doesn't have to be used that way. And I think the beauty of coaching is that um, although there are professional coaches out there 
that can be hired uh, to teach and coach. I think also we can coach each other, right? So if there's something that we've done, we know how to do, um, we can go beyond maybe like a mentorship arrangement and actually have a coaching relationship where you can actually help someone achieve their goal, uh, whatever that goal may be. And I, I think it's a collaborative effort. Um, mentorship can sometimes seem very, uh, I guess I'm going to use the word paternalistic or, or, or didactic that you're instructing someone how to do something rather than collaborating with them on it and working. Uh, Dr. Dirks mentioned the iterative nature of, of coaching. And I think that's a key part. It puts maybe to some degree on, on the level of a peer and having that interaction and that, that discussion and dialogue, I think is, is a good part of that. So we don't use paid coaching in my shop, but I think that it's a very useful tool and uh, certainly would be uh, helpful for a variety of reasons, not as Dr. Dirks mentioned, not just bad things, but good things too. All right, well, thank you for those answers. Now, it seems like, you correct me if I'm wrong, your institutions are very well supported. Um, but what about faculty that don't have any of this infrastructure at their shops, right? What do you recommend they do to find mentoring, sponsorship, and coaches for medical students, residency, residents, and faculty members? I will start with you, Dr. Paxson. I know you just finished, but Russian roulette, we're coming back. Uh, easy. Get involved with SAM. That's obvious. Uh, I think, um, Absolutely. you know, and I'm and being a little facetious, but it's true. Like, I think the best way, if you don't have infrastructure at your in your institution, find it somewhere else. Uh, if you don't have people that think like you, where you work, go find them somewhere else. They are out there. Uh, they're people that you will enjoy spending time and learning from out there. You just have to look for them. And I think the first part of that is finding out what you want to find. What is it that I want? Uh, start looking inward, I think, first. Uh, identify what infrastructure you're really missing, as in need but don't have, and then go out and find it somewhere. Um, the, the, the great thing about living in the 21st century is that we have access to all types of ways of communicating with people that didn't exist in, in history until now. And we should be leveraging those things and, and using like we are today. We're doing a lecture from various geographical sites. Um, this would never have been possible you know, a few years ago, but it is, and it's common now. So I think take advantage of that uh, and look for those resources elsewhere if you don't find them locally, because a lot of times you can get by uh, with the things you can find that are outside of your own institution. All right, Dr. Sharp. Uh, yeah, I just follow up on Dr. Paxton's comments that, um, yeah, get involved with the SAM uh, Research Committee or one of the SAM committees. I think you're going to find, you know, members there. If you engage and get involved, you're going to find people, you know, they may not have the same research interest as you, but or you can find people within that area that have, have research interests similar to you. Um, you can find mentors. You're going to be able to find, um, you know, if they're if you're rising, um, don't like you rising star in an area and you feel like you have a strength that you want to highlight it. Um, don't be afraid to like reach out and you know ask for sponsorship or uh, ask someone who if they know anyone in your field that they might be able to sponsor you. So again, I think engaging and, and reaching out is important. And then coaching, I think trying to find out what institutions. Uh, what your institution's capabilities are. And then if, if that's not available to you, again, I think, you know, a lot of us have to rely on uh, trying to self-improve. Um, so um, I think it's just trying to identify those tasks. One of the tasks that my mentor, you know, is that in, in graduate school, no one asked any questions at lectures or seminars. And everyone was just quiet afterwards. And he goes, but we're, you know, I know you're interested in these seminars. You're very interested. So guess what? Everybody has to ask a question at the end of the seminar. So, you know, you'd show up and, you know, you really force you to, to pay attention, think about it. And it just, it was became a, a lifelong thing. So now every time I go to a, a lecture, I'm almost always asking questions because there's always something that's, that's interesting, but that's sort of a mind, it was sort of a change of mind choice from staying not engaged to being engaged. So. Absolutely. And Dr. Dirks will. Yeah, no, I, th I think kind of just reiterating to show up, right? I think. I've never met someone that isn't willing to talk about their research when I ask them a question about it, you know, so even going to the poster sessions, if they have interests in a, a you know, poster or an abstract is on something that you're interested in, go talk to the author. Heck, they're standing by their posters or their electronic ones now, praying that someone actually gives a flying hoot about what they're presenting. So they would love <laughs> They would love someone to come talk to them. So do that. I think, as already mentioned, it doesn't have to be on the research committee. It's any committee you're on. 
You can find that whether it's in your own institution, looking outside your department and getting engaged so you can meet people. Um, you know, and you meet people, <laughs> mentors and sponsors to being on the SAM committee and meeting someone there who you resonate with, who can, you know, be their sponsor or mentor also. Um, I'll be honest, majority of my sponsors and mentors have been through connections I've made through committee work and typically SAM. And so really being engaged in that has been very extremely helpful and rewarding. Oh, these are excellent answers. We have one more written question and then we're gonna to go to some chat questions before we try to finish. Uh, what are your thoughts on mentorship, sponsorship and coaching for junior versus senior faculty? And is there established program or process for this? And if so, how do you do it? I will go to Dr. Paxton. Well, unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't uh, don't have access to that type of, uh, of uh, um, established program or process. Um, some institutions do, and when you do, it, it seems to work very well. Uh, one of the things that SAM is trying to do uh, actively, and the research committee is playing a large part in that, is trying to develop a mentorship network uh, that people at perhaps you could call them resource poor, resource poor institutions might uh, be able to find mentorship. And um, sometimes that's peer mentorship, right? It may not be necessarily somebody who's uh, technically in a position uh, uh, ahead or above you, uh, but perhaps a peer, uh, junior junior faculty coaching and mentoring other junior faculty. And I think this is the kind of thing we need more of, um, things on a national level that, that people can access without um, uh, needing to worry about what's available locally. So um, I think that is a, a real deficiency that we do suffer from. Uh, I don't think it's unique to emergency medicine, but it is something that we do need to improve on as a specialty. And I think that we are improving on currently. But, but it's not a lot in place that I've seen uh, personally. I will shift it over to Dr. Dirk. So junior versus senior faculty mentoring. You know, so I think we classically look at the junior faculty for the sponsor, kind of sponsor and mentorship and coaching, because that is a group that really needs the assistance when they come on board. And that's traditionally who we think about. I think I would suggest that the senior faculty probably need it just as much because we have a, we have a specialty that has changed so much you know, over time and the needs and the expectations and the skills um, are continue to evolve. And so it takes a lot of humility for a senior faculty to try to look for a mentor and to admit they need to improve, but making it more and normalizing it and cut would be extremely helpful to help everyone evolve and continue to grow uh, because that is what makes our specialty great that we have the opportunity to continue to evolve. And Dr. Sharp. I completely concur with Dr. Jarks and Paxson again. It's just that, you know, it, both junior faculty and senior faculty both need these three elements to for success, right? And so how do you find those elements? And I think, again, institutionally, you know, trying to figure out what the resources are institutional and then engaging nationally to get those resources. But yeah, totally concur. All right, so uh, we're gonna switch gears and talk about uh, marginalized groups. So what about special considerations for mentoring, sponsorship, or coaching for women in medicine, as well as underrepresented minorities? Studies have shown that these two groups uh, have lower numbers of full professors, lower numbers of leadership positions, and lower numbers of grants. I'm actually gonna start with Dr. Dirks. She's chair of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern. She has two female vice chairs, one of whom is the associate dean of GME and four women who are full professors. So Dr. Dirks, what do you think contributed to your success? And were these faculty given any special opportunities for mentorship, sponsorship, and coaching? Uh, I would say great people and great people to work with has contributed to my success. Um, I think that, um, being female, I'm, you know, absolutely more willing to, you know, and aware that sponsorship is is hard because um, in general, women don't ask for as much. Uh, the imposter sy syndrome is real. I think, uh, you know, Larissa Velez would probably say, um, if I hadn't pushed her maybe to, you know, consider strongly the deans, you know, because that was kind of a door I was able to, you know, at least put a foot in a little bit for her. And she definitely had the skill set to soar. I think that she may have not thought herself as that position right away, um, you know, even though she's again, more than qualified. And so I do think that um, making sure that you, I think sponsorship in mentorship is very important in groups of people who don't traditionally ask for, for things due to the imposter syndrome, which I know we could, 
I've heard a lot of arguments that it doesn't exist, and I will say it does. Um, I think you know all of us struggle with it a ton. Um, the underrepresented minorities is is one also, and I think that's also a group that we need to make sure we aren't putting them up for everything. Right. And I think that's some of the challenges the women get also is you want to, so, to be so involved, but there's not as many of them that you say, I'm going to sponsor you for everything. Um, and then so I think it really needs to be a discussion on what their values and the priorities are. So you make sure you sponsor them and things they can truly succeed in and give them the mentoring on what they really need. I think mentoring for me um, ends up being more coaching for some people because I don't understand everything in their background. And so it has to take a lot of effort and understand like, on my part to make sure that I am seeing things through their eyes and giving them the help they need from their perspective, not what I perceive to be what they need to succeed. And so I think that um, as we go into these groups that haven't traditionally, you know, reached the heights that everyone wants them to, I think it is um, incumbent on mentors and sponsors and coaches to make sure that we're looking at acknowledging our ignorance from our personal lens and trying to look through things from their lens. I'll shift it over to Dr. Paxton. Yeah, I think it's about communication. It's a, and it's about understanding. And it's it's about um, trying, making an effort to understand um, what their experience has been. Uh, and maybe if there's a reason they're not asking for things, what is that reason? Um, but encouraging and supporting and um, not trying to give them, as Dr. Dirks mentioned, too many things to do. Um, but trying to understand what it is that's important to them and where are their priorities and, and, and trying to provide for those rather than um, simply trying to put people in spots. Uh, that's not helping them. It may not even be helping the program. It's, it's more important to match people with their interests and skills. And that's just as true for individuals who are underrepresented than it, as it is for those that may be overrepresented. So I think that's a key part of this. It again, goes back to understanding another person's experience. Wonderful, absolutely. I, I concur with all of it. Dr. Sharp. Yeah, I think um, hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, I've been fortunate enough to benefit from mentors that were women, um, mentors that were underrepresented minorities, um, as well as uh, having mentees. Um, and I think that it's just like a good mentor really tries to understand the whole person and try to see where they're coming from um, and try to be understanding and to communicate. I think communication is the key. Um, I think that, um, you know, again, a mentor may recognize that they may not, they may have a mentee that um, may need some extra coaching or may need some mentorship in another area. So, you know, maybe they need, you know, they're looking for some, mentorship from other from people that think like them or um, look like them and so you you might say hey I think you know there's this group over here you should talk to them you know so you can get that additional support but I still you know I'm going to still help you with your research project and your academics but you know there may be elements of the mentorship relationship that I cannot fulfill um, but I can guide you to other areas where you can get those elements that you need for your professional growth and personal growth. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to take our last question from the chat. Uh, and this chat question says, do you get any departmental credit for being a mentor or sponsor for medical students, residents, or other faculty? Is this something your department values? Um, so I will start with Dr. Paxton. Great question. Question. I'm just going back around. <laughs> I, I think that's a great question. And the way it was phrased is great. It's uh, because I think that, that those are related concepts, right? I mean, we we pay for or we compensate what we value. And so Absolutely. I think you can tell right away, uh, even if you're interviewing with a department, um, what they think is important based on what they're paying you for. And uh, people can say, oh, we value this, we value that. But if they're not compensating, they're not valuing it. They're just, it's just lip service. So I think um, you have to look at that. And, and the, the hard part about this is how do you quantify, how do you um, convert effort into money or, or, or dollar value, right? And, and, or, and, and maybe it's not even dollars, maybe it's protected time or other resources that are needed to do the activity. And I, I think that's a key part of this is that you either need somebody who's, who's very over-motivated to work with people as a mentor, uh, and there are people like that out there, and I think there are a few on this panel, but I, but the other, 
either that type of person or someone who's going to be motivated in another way. And as I said before, I think individuals have to motivate themselves. So, um, and if, if you're an individual that's motivated uh, by money, by financial compensation for your time uh, or, or monetary units of some sort, then that's going to be an important part of, of getting you to, to be a mentor and spend the time necessary to get to know your mentee and do the job. Um, I know at my institution, they've worked very hard to try to come up with some type of the, uh, you know, in, in clinical practice, we have an RVU, you know, uh, and I think in, in educational EVU is a concept, right? So it's an educational value unit and, and mentorship and, and uh, lecturing would qualify on that type of a framework. So I think that is one way you can motivate people to be mentors is to, is to connect the time spent as a mentor uh, and the effort that they put forth in some type of a financial way. And I think some institutions are doing it better than others. What about you, Dr. Sharp? What do you think? Um, I, Well, it's sort of a nuanced um, answer because I mean, certainly every trainee that I have, um, I benefit from personally, just the growth that I experience from having them, from being able to guide them professionally and hopefully maintain that relationship so that there's a personal reward with that. There's professional reward and then I, I, you know, A, they help me with my projects. Hopefully I'm helping them with their projects and, and I get to list them on my CV. You know, I list them, you know, I've interacted with them. So there's that. But if you're talking about um, sort of direct um, benefits in terms of, oh, you got promoted because I mentored students, um, I can tell you my profession is probably not, I mean, it's a part of it. It's probably listed on my thing, but, you know, being professional, promoted to associate professor or to professors, not, that's not going to be the make or break decision. It's going to be, were you publishing? Were you getting grant funding? Did you have national standing? Those are the big ones. But those things don't come without, usually without working with ment mentees. And so I, I would say it's, uh, they're kind of tied together, but you're looking for that direct link, probably not there, but it's certainly indirect. Okay, Dr. Dirks. Yeah, you know, I think that you, you have both kind of areas covered. One is, does the department value it? And one is, does it help you professionally, right? And should you value it? And I think, you know, from a department very much like Dr. Paskins, we have an, we have a kind of educational or academic productivity unit. We didn't put the word value in it because people didn't want there to be kind of judgments associated and mentoring is part of that. Also mentoring is part of our university kind of scripted annual evaluation. Um, the key we and challenge we had is what is mentoring, right? And what components mentoring, you know, is it going out to coffee with the third year resident assigned to you? <laughs> Probably not, right? When you think about it, really. And so we had to put a little bit of a kind of a lane on what really we considered a valuable and enhancing career, you know, for, a, for someone's uh, mentoring experience. But I agree also, I have not written a promotion letter yet that I have not mentioned that they mentor students, residents, fellows, either through research or education. And so I think as an individual, there should be an inherent value to you and your own career uh, by getting engaging in the development of others. Well, what a riveting discussion. I wanna take this time to thank all of our panelists and thank you for all of your input and sharing your experiences. Uh, and your successes, we are very, very grateful. And we want to thank everyone for joining us today at the Research Learning Series. Uh, this message was recorded. You'll be able to view this at a later time. Um, and that's all. Any parting words from any of our panelists? Thanks for your heart great job uh, moderating. You're more than welcome. It was a pleasure to meet everyone. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Kayla and Lynn.